Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this week's Squawk Talk on Socialist Telly. And I'm absolutely delighted to welcome my two guests to the programme today. Both uh, run very important unions in the union movement. Uh, we have Ian Hudson from the Bakers Union, BFAWU, and Matt Rack from the Fire Brigade Union. So we'll be talking tonight about what's going on in their particular unions in the movement in general, and also a little bit about what's going on between the unions and the Labour Party, because I think there's some interesting things to uh, talk about there. And uh, I think it will be a, a lively and interesting show now in these two characters. Um, welcome, gents. Thank you very much for joining me tonight. Um, Matt, uh, the Fire Brigade Union has been um, one of the main forces uh, pushing the recall conference. Uh, tell us a little bit about what that's about and why, the, uh, why you and the union think that, that we need to have one. Well, I think, I think the, the idea initiated elsewhere, but we discussed it at our executive uh, a, week, a couple of weeks ago, and I think we're aware of some of the, the problems in the Labour Party. We have a, a enormous number of local CLP officers who are being suspended. Uh, we have concerns about what is being allowed to be debated at local party uh, meetings. Uh, and I think there's a feeling that that is being done from above, uh, you know, issue, orders issued by the General Secretary, and then being uh, enforced by regional staff of Labour parties. And I suppose for many of us in the Labour Party, including for us in the FBU, is the Labour Party belongs to the members and they should have the right, first of all, for free, to free speech, freedom of discussion. And it's up to them what they want to, to discuss. Uh, and when you have such a high level of uh, disciplinary uh, proceedings pending against people, then I think there's something of a crisis. And it seemed to us logical that actually, let's get this out in the open, let's have an open debate about it. And one way to do that would be to recall uh, the party's conference. Uh, the most democratic structure within the party should, should be the supreme government of the Labour Party. Um, and that, that seems to us logical. In my own union, if we, if we have particular issues that come up, we will recall conference and the delegates who attended the last conference will come along and make decisions. Now, I have to be clear, we're not um, expecting that that's going to carry very easily at all. But I think it is something around which those of us who want to stand up for party democracy and freedom of speech and freedom of discussion around which we can mobilise, it seems to us a perfectly reasonable uh, demand to make. And what kind of response have you seen from people to that? I mean, uh, there are other unions that have got on board and momentum and, and members groups, etc. Yeah. But uh... yeah, I've seen that uh, it's it's it seems to be building some momentum. I think it is uniting people. I think some people are sceptical about whether you with with a when the left hasn't got a majority on the NEC, it clearly would be an NEC decision to call it, and people are sceptical about that. Uh, and I mean, for me, that's not the only issue. It's, it, it, it is, firstly, it's a reasonable demand. It's a democratic demand. It's about the rights of party members. So let's put it to the, uh, to the leadership of the party. Let's put it to the NEC. Why would they not support such uh, a move? And I suppose for myself, if, if they determine not to, then actually perhaps others need to organise a conference. You need to, you know, if, if, and I think there's a debate to be had with some of the other unions around that. But uh, let's get ourselves organised to discuss what sort of party we want uh, uh, going forward, as we come out of COVID, for example. Yes, and I think one of the, perhaps one of the breaks on it, certainly from members that I talk to, seems to be that um, so far the, the right-dominated NEC has shown a, a perfect willingness to ignore the usual uh, procedures of going through the conference in terms of some of the other actions that they've taken. So... They, uh, they changed the uh, rules in the um, NEC elections yeah. uh, from the CLP, you know, the member representatives, so that instead of being, uh, you know, done on the normal basis, it was going to be done on this uh, you know, transferable vote system, yeah. which guaranteed that some of the right wings were going to get on there. And we've seen a, a, an acting general secretary, according to the party's rules, be called the general secretary all the time, even though he hasn't yet been confirmed by conferences, the rules demand. Yeah, I, th I find it a bit strange, and, and it'll be interesting Ian's views on this, but the way we, with, with rules in, in our union, for example, 
Uh, I've, I found it strange that you turn up to a Labour Party conference and that the morning as you go into the debate, you get handed the rules that you're going to vote on that, that day. <laughs> For us, our members would be told months in advance of a conference, here's a rule change, and they have the right to amend that. So it's all above board, open. Everyone can see what's going to be debated. They can take positions on it. They come to the conference ready for the debate. Uh, and the idea that you change procedures halfway through, you know, that the, the body that is due to be elected changes the rules of its own election. It seems completely uh, outlandish. Uh, and, and you wouldn't be able to do that in in, uh, in any of the unions. I mean, well, there's, there's legal requirements on how unions elect executives and so on. So I think a lot of union activists will find all of those procedures a bit uh, unsettling um, and things that, if we're talking about genuinely democratising the Labour Party, things that should be should be addressed. Those decisions, to me, are conference decisions. Yes. And I think there's the accountability issue, because if, if your union tried to put a stunt like that, then uh, there's the certification officer that people could make complaints to and would be coming down and presumably like a ton of bricks uh, hey. for, for not sticking with your rules and following your proper procedures. So let's bring Ian in on that, if, he's, uh, if you're ready to, uh, to chip in there, Ian. I mean, you, you know, then we'll come on to the issues that the Baker's union's got with, uh, with the party shortly, but... You know, how, have you been keeping up with this issue with the, the recall conference or with the assault on the free speech of members? No, no absolutely. I mean, um, I, I think I think it's a right call. I, I do I do support the call uh, for recalling conference. I think um, you know there's there's been significant issues that has been raised in the in the last twelve months, two years uh, that, that that need to be debated. I mean, we didn't get the opportunity in September. Uh, I mean, I did see online. I did see a remark. I think. Clive Lewis made in relation to we couldn't actually uh, have a conference um, but yet the Labour Party is currently organising the Women's Conference which is going to be held online. Uh, there was a conference of sorts last year. Uh, technology has moved on, most trade unions are holding uh, their conferences online and you know we'll be making a decision uh, after we hear the roadmap out on the 22nd of February about whether or not you know our union will hold its uh, conference uh, online. So I think, you know, the, the ability to do it is there. And then my understanding is, is the rule book says that the NEC can call one within 10 days. So I mean, you know, at the next DC, which I think is where the debate can take place, which I think is about the 11th of March. Um, by the 21st of March, we could all be getting together and debating potentially, you know, I read on, on, on social media, that over the last 12 months, it looks like we've lost 110,000 members. It looks like, obviously, the, the black hole that's appearing in the finances of the Labour Party, you know, obviously, because we're aware that Unite has reduced its contribution. You know, we're, we're seeing a significant reduction in membership. So the party is looking and it appears in Scotland. They, they, they took advice and guidance uh, which has led to the leader of the Scottish Labour Party resigning and now we're having an election because he didn't meet the needs of a potential donor. You know, and those things need to be discussed and debated. And, you know, we're a membership organisation. It always fascinates me how people who are elected to uphold democracy, you know, suddenly don't like democracy when it makes them accountable. For something. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think, you know, anybody that believes in democracy would recognise it's a reasonable ask um, from, from paying party members, would see that it's right to be inclusive and would recognise the role that, that we all can play, you know, as a one member, one vote organisation in making sure that, that we create an opportunity to build unity so we can go out and win those elections in May, which currently... You know, we're, we're looking like we're going to, you know, take a significant kick in. Yes, I mean, it's uh, I'm, I'm wary of doing Keir Starmer's job for him and talking down expectations so that he can uh, he can try and get off the hook if, if the results do go badly. But yeah, the feedback from around the country, you know, the Labour Party is struggling to get candidates in a lot of working class areas, never mind to actually win positions. So it's it's not looking great. Um I think, you know, I don't know if you guys have kept abreast of the, um, the situation with the members that got reinstated uh, in the last week or so from, from suspension. 
after having been suspended for, for allowing motions of solidarity with Jeremy Corbyn to be debated by their uh, CLPs or motions of no confidence in Keir Starmer and David Evans. Uh, but in one of those letters that, that reinstated uh, 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 the, these people back to their uh, party membership, they were warned in uh, very threatening terms by the party that if they were to repeat their, uh, you know, their contravention of the principles of the party, which apparently are more to do with, uh, you know, obeying what David Evans says than with any sense of solidarity or, or duty to the members who elected them to those posts, uh, then they'd, you know, they'd face even worse consequences in the future. Um, but it does seem to be a, a full on war, not just on free speech, but on the basic principles of the movement. So, you know, solidarity and democracy are right at the heart of what we do. And, and have to be in the unions, but but the party at the moment is saying that the uh, the wishes of the general secretary and the edicts of him and the party leader trump any of that. Yeah, I think that's that's I've I've not seen the letters. I've I've obviously heard accounts of people being reinstated, and the point that you you mentioned is is one that causes me a little bit of concern because if people have not been through any disciplinary process, I'm not sure how the Labour Party can then say. You've been a bad boy or girl, and we're going to let you back in, but we're giving you a warning. If you do it again, uh, we'll be we'll be uh, taking it very very seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, that seems a bit unfair to me. That uh, again, I'm not sure you'd get away with that in any other walk of life. Um, mm -hmm. Finding guilt without any process, or uh, assigning guilt without any process, having gone through, having been gone through. So, I think uh, that's something we, I think we need to to look at. Ian, what do you reckon? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by a, a due process which doesn't include the person that's supposed to have committed the crime, not being able to to have an opportunity, one, to know what the crime was or two, to, to have the ability to defend themselves. I mean, you know, to me, democracy and a democratic organisation means that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm able to speak up and speak out because that's what, you know, as a, as a, as a Labour Party, uh, we're encouraged to do. I mean, you know, if the Labour Party is too timid uh, to uphold the rules of democracy. What, what's it going to do if it ever becomes a government? I mean, I suppose that's the question that people are going to be asking, you know, if it's too timid to allow its members to speak, or what's it going to do if it's challenged uh, anywhere, you know, by, by another country? Are we just going to say, oh, we can't take part in that conversation? I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty poor show. And I think it's terrible that the, the General Secretary of the Labour Party has become the story. I mean, I don't remember any general secretary before before David Evans being the story and, and being the person who makes the decisions on who can and who can't be representative in a constituency Labour Party, you know, the people that raise the funds to fund the party. Well, and it kind of adds in, insult to injury in the fact that he hasn't even been officially confirmed in the position yet. <laughs> and yet people, you know, and, and to my mind, you know, I mean, I, I was a CLP chair for a couple of years until, you know, reasonably recently. And my first responsibility, as I saw in that, was to the people who had elected me to be in that position. And that didn't matter to me whether they came from the right of the party, the left of the party, you know, in the middle. It was about giving everybody a fair say, giving everybody the chance to talk about what they wanted to talk about and, and have a democratic vote at the end of it on, on what went through. Um, and yet we're seeing these diktats from Party Central, you know, telling members what they can and can't talk about telling members, um, you know, what, they'll face consequences if they dare to break that. And, and actually, you know, in these letters reminding them that their ultimate duty now apparently is to obey the uh, general secretary, they leave the acting bit out. Um, it's a recipe it, for disaster, isn't it, really? Because, I mean, the, the Labour Party, any political party relies on its members. If you want to win elections and go out door knocking and uh, campaigning, then you have to have that membership base. And if that membership base becomes so intimidated that, you know, I've heard people, you know, who may, who may not support what's happening, but are becoming intimidated by the fear that they may also get treated in the same way. So it is a way of shutting people down much wider than the ones who've been caught up in the, in the dragnet so far. And that's, that's, that's a recipe for losing more and more members if we're not careful. We don't know yet, of course, what kind of campaigning is going to be allowed under the, whatever rules will be applying with the pandemic at the, at the point when um, the campaign properly kicks off. But, you know, I, I hear from Labour members all across the country and there is a very 
high degree of people who are saying, I'm not going out on the doorstep, even if we're allowed to. I'm, you know, how can I campaign for this when, when it looks as though we're the fall guys? And, you know, I think it was Tony Benn who said, you know, you can watch how a government, you know, watch how a government is treating um, people in other countries because that's how they'll treat people here if they think they can get away with it. And I think the, you know, that almost flips around at the moment. If you want to see how Starmer and Co would govern uh, the country, then look how they're treating the Labour members because they're the ones that are being put in a position to be in the, uh, the powerless victims at the moment. Well, hopefully not too powerless, Ian. So, I mean, the, the Baker's Union is in the middle of a process that is uh, that, that may kind of uh, stick, a, stick a flag in the ground and say, well, sorry, I won't say flag because we know Keir Starmer's too keen on that, but stick a marker stick a marker in the ground and, and you know, that, that you're not going to put up with it. So tell, tell us a bit what's going on there. I, did, I didn't realise I was coming on a programme where I might need to wear a sharp suit and bring my union flag in. So I could have, have a selfie taken. I've heard that in mind if I get invited back. Um, obviously, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we made the announcement uh, last year in, in relation to um, the disappointment we felt um, firstly linked with the decision to move from two metres to one to enable them to open up uh, the economy so they could you know, uh, get people back into pubs and restaurants, which obviously puts some of our uh, members at risk. Um, I mean, in many of our factories, the two metre issue, um, you know, was, was, a, was, a, was, was, was critical for us for keeping our members safe. And we were disappointed with the, the Labour Party response when Keir Starmer uh, got up and decided that he would agree with um, Boris Johnson, allegedly, because he had to say something at the dispatch box. So I was told he couldn't be seen there not being able to say something. So I suggested that maybe if he doesn't know the answer, that maybe he should seek uh, advice and guidance, which obviously uh, I think in, in those circumstances is borne out to be correct, because quite clearly, you know, from reducing from two metres to one has put many, many people's life not just at risk but unfortunately has caused the death of many of many of the citizens uh, in our country um so that and then obviously a number of other incidents that that uh, we were unhappy with the suspension of members the suspension of our members the suspension of jeremy corbyn um the support for for, for the right to rape um and you know assault people um, which goes against, you know, everything that we as a trade union believe in. Um, you know, the, the decisions that, that's been taken to, to become the party of business rather than the party of the working people um, meant that, that we, we, we quite rightly should consult our membership on whether or not they, they thought that the, rep the representation we was uh, paying for as an affiliate, and bearing in mind we've been linked with the Labour Party in one shape or another since the 1890s, uh, when we were addressed by a real uh, socialist called Kia uh, Hardy uh, in London after, after we'd, we'd shut down a factory. Um, we were campaigning for, 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 for decent pay and, and, and hours, uh, along with um, our, 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 our fellow journeymen from the, from the Jewish Bakers Union. Um, we, one way or another, been involved in, in, the, in the Labour Party. I think 1902 was when we was uh, getting independent Labour councillors elected in Barnsley. Um, you know, as the operative bakers, we decided that you know we, we should ask our members if, if they felt that you know their hard earned cash uh, should be given uh, to the uh, to the Labour Party. It's been interesting. I mean, we we were going to carry on this. This, this survey until the, until the end of March, when, when obviously we'll be reviewing uh, the figures, but the, the early indications are, are not good. You know, the, the, the suggestions are that, that most of our members do not feel that, you know, the Labour Party has, has their interests or values. I mean, 9% is the current figure I've got in front of me that the West people believe that the Labour Party represents their views, the majority of people. And how many, how many members has the union got all together? I mean, we're only a small union. We've got 16,000 members, but most of those members are based in what's, what's often referred to as the Red Wall seat, you know. Where, Sorry, we've lost you slightly there. Uh, lost you slightly, Ian. I said, you know, where, where we're based mainly is in what's often referred to as the Red Wall seats. Yes. Uh, you know, if you think about us as a trade union, we started, um, in 1847 in Manchester and, you know, the majority of our members are in the North and Midlands. 
Um, yes, we have some bakeries down south and some members down south, but predominantly we're in what's regarded as those red wall seats. You know, part of the reason why we as a union campaigned uh, to leave the European Union was because most of our members felt that being part of the European Union had put them at a disadvantage. You know, none of them, none of them was, was campaigning to leave because they thought migrants were the problem. Everyone was campaigning because they thought the issues they saw it was, was the, 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 the changes that had impacted on them had happened because of the membership of the European Union. So, I mean, there is a strong feeling in those communities that they've been abandoned by politicians um, that's supposed to represent our interests for years. Unfortunately, that's what these survey figures are starting to show. Well, that brings us on to a, a, an interesting point we'll touch on in a second, but I, I think it's interesting that the uh, the Baker's Union is, is debating whether or not to continue funding. We've seen Unite cut back its funding of the party. Uh, we've seen a big hole in the Labour finances, which I covered not too long ago in, in on Squawkbox, uh, to the tune of several millions of pounds that uh, that they're short and scrabbling around, which probably links into why they're sucking up to the, uh, the donors and sacking Scottish leaders because of it. Um, but, uh, you know, Keir Starmer's need to win back the uh, so-called red wall, it's not a term that I like using because it didn't exist until the 2019 election really, uh, and was used mostly as a media device to uh, try to set people up to think that, you know, their, their Labour was there to be knocked down. But, um, you know, in those working class town seats, you know, we, we lost hugely because you know, the Labour Party had a position in 2017 that was to respect the Brexit referendum, but try to do a decent job of coming out instead of the way the Tories have done it. Um, and, and they perceived that as a, as a betrayal to turn around and say, you know, we're, we're now going to give the people who wanted to stay in another chance to, uh, to win that vote, having lost it in the first place. Um, but Keir Starmer, you know, if reports are correct this week, his solution to uh, getting back to those people is to appoint Peter Mandelson as uh, as a key advisor on the basis that he knows how to uh, how to solve that situation. What do you guys make of that? I think the uh, idea that, that Peter Mandelson has has any idea about the lives that our members lead um, is 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 just you know I mean this is a guy that was you know pictured in two thousand and five with Epstein you know that was on a yacht. Yeah. Uh, worth, I think it was fifty million pound. I don't, I don't think, I don't think unless our people are visiting um, some place that's got a building worth fifty million pound, it's the closest they'll ever come to anybody uh, that actually has fifty million quid. You know, I mean, the, the reality of the life that he leads and and and, and, and the communities that, that Labour needs to engage with is so far apart. Um, as, 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 as a tragedy, really. I think. Matt, uh, you make it? Yeah, I think. I've probably got a slightly different take on the on the referendum to, to Ian, um, but I, th I think Mandelson, looking at that from a, a slightly different point, Labour's been losing votes in working class communities for decades mm -hmm. and have been taken for granted uh, by the Labour establishment for decades. And we know that, you know, we've seen decades of deindustrialisation that has wrecked communities. And the truth is that Labour governments and local authorities have frankly, not been able to deliver in terms of, of changing the fortunes of those of those uh, parts of the country. So it's inevitable, I think, that there's been a, a, an anti-establishment mood and that, be, that did become focused in, in, the, in the referendum. Well, I, think, uh, I, I think Peter Mandelson's part of the problem rather than part of the solution because I think it was, it was exactly that approach that saw, lay, yeah, Labour won uh, some elections, but uh, each time... We saw a, a reduction in the in the, in the Labour vote, um, ending up where where we were in 2010. So, uh, I mean, winning winning for the Labour policies and winning for socialist ideas is not going to be easy, and it's going to it is a big project. And I think the one thing that uh, Jeremy Corbyn's uh, election uh, achieved was mobilising people to with the view that actually you can challenge the establishment from a radical point of view and clearly drawing in around that hundreds of thousands of people into political activity for the first time or, or reinvigorating people into that 
And although that might not be it, I'm not, no one's saying that's easy because we're up against a very powerful system and a very powerful establishment. Uh, but the answer to that, those challenges, is not to retreat to the failures of the past, in my view. And that, I think that's that's unfortunately where we seem to be heading. Yes. Well, I mean, Keir, uh, Peter Mandelson infamously said that, uh, you know, to Peter Hay back in 99, that um, he, he was wrong to be worried about what the working class thought about anything because they didn't have anywhere else to go. And we've seen where that mentality got us. And as you say, you know, they, we spent most of the next... Uh, well, 16, 17 years from that, at least, shedding working class votes left, right and centre and, and ended up where we were, ended up where we were in Scotland through a very well, similar just, kind just, of uh, just, process to take people for granted. Just a quick point on, on Ian's consultation with his, with his union, or sorry, his union's consultation with the members. Obviously, I mean, we were not as old as that as a union. We were founded in 1918, joined the late, affiliated to Labour in the 1920s. Uh, but of course, it was under Blair uh, in the aftermath of uh, us daring to ask for a pay rise and daring to vote for a strike, that we eventually disaffiliated for decades. Uh, and that was precisely because you had uh, people who were paying their union contributions, part of which was going to the Labour Party, and you had one Labour minister described us as fascists because we dared to vote for, uh, in Scotland, uh, for daring to vote for uh, industrial action. And we were described in part in Westminster as criminally irresponsible. I mean, you know, this is against people who were funding that party. So that's why in 2004 we, we voted to disaffiliate. So I don't think the Labour leadership should take these things lightly. They should take it very seriously. People uh, are rightly sceptical of all politicians and they will hold people to account, including union leaders. If we just keep saying, don't worry, keep, keep backing these people, it's, it doesn't always wash. So I think it, I think what's going on in, in Ian's union is very serious for uh, for the Labour Party, and it should be taken very seriously by Keir Starmer and the national executive. I think it could easily become a trend if it if it does go that way. Then mm. uh, you know it, it 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 would reflect you know that people in unions are reflective of their communities, and if the communities are disenchanted with the Labour Party, then, uh, you know, that, that will be reflected in the way things happen in the unions as well, I'm sure. Um, you know, we, the idea that Peter Mandelson will be the solution <laughs> to winning back a working class community is, is an interesting one. Um, and to me reflects a bit of desperation, but, you know, whatever you think on the Brexit, you know, whichever way you, you were on the Brexit referendum on, uh, you know, and, and subsequently, whatever you think was the right thing to do. The, the, I think it's beyond dispute, although the right wing do still try to dispute it, that a lot of people saw that as a betrayal when Labour switched from saying, well, we'll enact that, uh, to, to suddenly saying, no, we won't, we'll, we'll go to the referendum. Mm. Um, but if you're showing contempt for the working class in, in the way that, you know, the, the, the people that you appoint, I think there's a, there's a serious problem. But, you know, we've also got the issue of, credibility and, and trust in politics as well, because that's a, at a very low ebb, I would think. And, you know, apart, quite apart from his views on the working class and his liking for meeting billionaires on yachts, um, Peter Mandelson had to resign uh, more than once, if I remember correctly, uh, from positions be, because of uh, issues with his, uh, you know, kind of tenure in, in various positions. So, you know, it's not, it doesn't seem to me, how, you know, I can't see how that is going to bring back trust within the Labour movement, trust within the wider community. I think uh, one thing that strikes me about why people become cynical about politics is it does look, when you go to Westminster or you see Westminster politicians on the telly, it does look like a machine that turns out people who all talk the same and dress the same and bought, by and large spout the same or similar policies and mm. people see through it and that's why there's a internationally a bit of a, a rebellion against that. And unfortunately some of it's going it's not going our way uh, you know there's a rebellion to the right uh, mm. as part of that and you know even trumpism reflects that to some to some degree um but the answer is not to just replicate the machine politics of the of the 2000s you know and that's that's i think what, what some people are trying to trying to do if we if we really want to change things and stand up for working people then we're going to, we, they've got to become organized we need we need more bakers in parliament for example 
that's, mm. who've actually worked on the shop floor. But there's far too few people who've ever worked on the shop floor who, who are going into Parliament. To, to, we, we, need, we need fighters in Parliament, people who, who don't just... And no disrespect to people who do it, but people who, who go to university, leave, become a researcher for an MP, and then an MP, and then a minister. Fair play to them, or, you know, good luck to them. But we, we need more bus drivers, nurses, teachers, uh, bakers, and so on in Parliament. So I think that's what the Labour Party was supposed to be built around 100 years ago. I think the, pro the problem is it's gone the other way now, because I don't know if you've seen about this uh, new pledge and kind of standards they're going to apply to uh, potential candidates for anything looks very much like they're going for the cookie cutter you know let's let's replicate Keir Starmer as much as we can because what can possibly go wrong um so anybody with anything even slightly kind of you know contentious in their past anybody who's taken a radical position on anything going to find it very hard to become candidates at all and I agree I mean we need you know somebody who knows what it's like to try and eke out a living on the wages you can earn on in a crisp factory or yeah. climbing up a ladder and, and holding the hose pipe. You know? and, and yet the party hierarchy as it is now seems to be doing everything that it can to strangle that from, from ever becoming uh, you know, more, than, more than a tiny trickle uh, within the party. And we need more working class MPs, we're probably going to get less from them. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think, you know, the, the, a clear example of that was, was the decision, obviously, you know, his focus groups, which is which is advising him uh, what he should wear and, and what he should look like when he's, when he's, when he's uh, doing his, uh, his interviews. Obviously, the, the advice and guidance that obviously he's getting from Peter Mandelson, the architect of uh, student uh, tuition fees and, and all, 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 all of that good stuff that he, that, he, that, he was, um, that he was involved in doing. And at the same time, you know, getting rid of the very people that, that need to engage uh, with people in the communities, you know, the closing down of the community unit, which was actually created uh, to build a relationship in the towns and cities across the country. You know, if you've got to connect um, in those communities, then, then you have to have a base on the ground. You see, if you look today at the difference between now and the 50s, the 60s and the 70s, when, when the labour movement was very strong, most, most, most areas had working men's clubs, um, they were linked to the trade union movement, they were linked to the Labour Party, and all of those bases is where we was able to get our message into the communities. Well, they don't exist anymore. And, you know, we, we're reliant on a mainstream media that doesn't serve our interest, it serves the interests of big business. But instead of wanting to, to create uh, the opportunity to have a Labour message put out there, the Labour Party machine is quite happy to move to a, to a ground where they're, they're fighting for the same types of funding that, they, that the Tories are attracting. Because it's not about changing the system anymore. It's about changing the people to fit in the system. And the Labour Party was never created to do that. The Labour Party was, you know, a, a result of the Peterloo massacre, you know, where people were, you know, demanding the right to vote. It was a result of people campaigning and all of all of the things that they went through to get to that point where we actually created a political party to make sure that we didn't have to fit into the system. The system was going to be designed to work for us. And now we've got a situation where the political system has been manipulated by the people with the power and the wealth to make sure that we're as far away from it as we have ever been. And, and, oh. and that's the message we have to get into those communities. But without a political, you know, party to do that, then, then it is reliant. I mean, it's reliant on the new forms of media, which you're uh, creating. It's reliant on trade unions to get that message out there. And, you know, a few years ago, when Ed Miliband won the leadership, and, I, and I'll always remember it because it was, it was just after we'd, we'd, lost, lost, we'd lost the election and, Obviously, um, it was looking like, you know, it was the same bland types of, of people that were standing for the party. And I was at the FBU conference with, with, with Dave, we were doing the Blacklisters thing downstairs. The first time I met, actually, Rebecca Long-Bailey uh, at your conference in, in Blackpool. And, and, and I met with a couple of other people. I said, well, we're going to have to forget these politicians now. And what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to create Britain's version of a, of a civil rights movement politicians no longer represent our interest 
And we need to build a movement that looks out for us, you know, that talks about the issues that we have in our lives, the fact that our housing is too poor and inadequate. And it's never been migrants, by the way, that, that denied us the right to have a decent home. It's always been decisions by pol uh, politicians and corporations who fund those politicians because it serves their interests. It's never been about, you know, um, a migrant coming over here and introducing a zero hours contract. That was greed of employers who sought the opportunity to seek more profit out of labour. You know, so, I mean, I think those are the messages that we need to get across to people because that's how we can make a difference. I mean, we used to refer to it as called socialism. But obviously today what we've got to do is we rebrand it as trade unionism again and then build that movement from the ground up to change people's lives because we have the answers to the questions that they pose, but they don't get to hear them. You know, and that's why I think, you know, you know what you're doing is, is, is fantastic. And obviously, you know, with the more of this media that we get out there to, 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 to engage with people, the better. Yeah, but I'll just pick up on one of Ian's points there uh, about the, um, the, the, the when the, the Labour movement at its high points, if you like. If you look back to the 50s, 60s, 70s, take, take one industry, the mining industry, a huge industry in the past in the, in the British economy. But in those communities, then the, the union would play a huge role in the community. Most, most, many people would, would uh, in some places, everyone worked in the pit or had somebody in the family who worked in the pit. Therefore, the union, the miners' welfare and so on. And mm. it's on the back of that, as Ian says, that you get a labour movement emerging. And then, of course, deindustrialization has completely wiped that out. And what we haven't done as a movement is face up to how do you rebuild a movement in a different environment when we haven't got those those traditional industries anymore and i think that's why the, the community organizing was a great initiative or potentially a great initiative and unfortunately they're killing it off before yeah. uh, before it's even had a chance to build but i think it's that movement building that uh, the ian's referred to that we need to really it's not just about winning this or that election it's about building a movement that once you establish that movement and and, and build it and consolidate it that's when you will and can win elections well, for the Labour Party for the time being, at least certainly it shows no indication of being interested in engaging with communities. As you say, they've just they've just sacked all their uh, community organisers just in the run up to the uh, to the local elections in May, which are across the country. Um, I think it has to be the unions that are driving this and, and are the the vehicle for getting out into the communities, really, because I think you guys are the ones who've got the presence and the uh, you know in, the, in certainly in the case of the bigger unions, the, the resources to be able to make that happen you know we're trying with socialist telly and with the independent media to be a voice that, for working people and let working class people say their own thing mm. um but you know we're one little piece of that but uh you know there, there needs to be i think a complete restructuring of how the the labor movement rather than the party works and gets out to community because if we're if we're going to get those messages across and those channels that used to be there the working men's clubs etc um and not there now then we need to find what the other ways are going to be that work because otherwise the, the, the only other alternative is to cede the field to uh, to the enemy and let them let them have their way with it. Mm. So what you know, on that point then, so what, what are the unions, you know, what are your two unions doing um, positively on the ground? What successes are you having at the minute? What are the issues that you're, you're specifically facing uh, in your own um, memberships and workplaces, etc.? Well, uh, for all, I mean, for us, COVID has been a huge issue that, you know, as it is for all unions. And I think it's flagged up the issues around workplace safety, uh, workplace safety in turn, in turn has flagged up the need for unions, but not just unions where people are members of unions, but unions that organise in the workplace and have safety reps in the workplace. Because ultimately you cannot rely on the health and safety executive uh, or people above. You have to be organised on the ground. Uh, firefighters have, you know, first of all, kept a fire step going through COVID. And I think something that we need to bear in mind for all unions is this term key workers, which is people in the public and the private sector. Uh, so we shouldn't allow any division between, between the two, um, who've been placed at additional risk by their employer by being required to go into work. But it looks like in many cases they're now being stitched up by their employers. We see attack, you know, fire and rehire. We see downgrading of conditions. 
we've just found out um, uh, that uh, the government sees us as a major obstacle and they, they uh, an inspectorate report, supposedly into the fire service, but actually turned out to be into the fire brigades union, uh, identified us as a major obstacle uh, to flexibility and change or whatever it is they, they want to achieve. And they, they've announced that they will be bringing forward legislation to tackle us as a union. I mean, that, so on the back of COVID, uh, rather than saying we're all, you know, we're all in this together, we pull through together, they are using it to clobber workers and to attack unions. And I think that's, that's what we're going to see uh, more of. Public sector pay freeze announced again um, in November. So uh, we, we're in for a, a challenging time. Uh, and I think we are all going to have to work together. Um, equally, we've all found new ways of operating online and so on. It's, there's a lot to learn from it, from, the, from how we've worked in the past year. There's a lot of downsides to it, but I think there are some upsides that we can use to how we do this political discussion, yes. engagement with members and so on. So they're actually bring, talking about legislation now specifically to attack the, the Pay Brigade Union. It's not just the movement in general, it's, it's your specific yes. union. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, that, that's where the principles in the movement could re really have to come into play because, you know, if we let them pick one union off, then it's going to only going to be a matter of time before they turn their attention on the next one and work their way up the food chain to, uh, to to try to take out everybody. And it has to be an injury to one is an injury to all, to all and we've, we've all got to stick together. So what can people who are, you know, whether they're in a union or, or not, but who want to support your union in terms of fighting against what's going on what what, what can people do practically well, well we'll we'll be building that campaign i mean this is only in the past couple of weeks this has all emerged um and we will be building that campaign and publicizing it so people can look at our website twitter feeds uh, and so on and we will be asking people for you know petitions supports lobbying of mps and so on Unfortunately, we have got to lobby Tory MPs, for example, if we're going to try and defeat uh, legislation. Um, but I think we do have to expose some of the hypocrisy of relying on millions of workers who did have to go to work and many other people were asked to stay at home. And then the reward they get is pay free, an attack on their conditions, and in our case, an attack on their union rights as well. I mean, it's, it's pretty sickening um, from a government that talks about levelling up uh, we know that actually one of the best ways of levelling up society is through trade unionism and what they are committed to further attacks on, on union rights. Mm. Ian, were you waving a, a pen to get in on that discussion? There? Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, listen, you know, our members have been magnificent throughout, throughout this, you know, keeping, keeping the nation fed, you know, and, you know, our, our hearts go off to all of those people that have been, you know, on the front line and, you know, we, we always recognise that, you know, there, there, there is there is no differential between a worker. Um, it's just the way that they're often termed. I mean, you know, we're, we're often termed as uh, low skills. We're not low skills. We're just undervalued. And I think this 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 pandemic has shown that because you know, without without those food workers, people people would have gone hungry. Um, you know, it's it's been a struggle for most people anyway. Um, and, and we're we're a low paid industry, and, and obviously most of our reps have done a fantastic job. In making sure that if anybody got the symptoms or, or um, needed to isolate, uh, that they were their, their pay was protected. Our, our health and safety reps um, are brought in new working practices that are, that are enabled um, those those workplaces to protect people and, and 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 make sure that they you know they didn't risk their families as well. You know our, our reps have done a magnificent job. Uh, I, I think. Um, in 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 um, you know one keeping the nation fed, two protecting the people they work alongside, and you know for example the Green Corps in, in Northampton, uh, they received an award uh, which was quickly made for, for for unsung heroes because of what they did. I mean they were actually the first company to be legislated against uh, for for having a an outbreak. There was over three hundred of them that got COVID and. You know, our reps fought because they were only getting statutory sick pay. They got um, a, a company sick pay introduced, uh, which was equivalent to 80% of the wages, um, which then led them to, to, to being able to, to isolate um, without having to rely on statutory sick pay, which was quite important. Um, because often we get told, well, you've got universal credit to fall back on. That can take weeks, but unfortunately for many of these people, 
who are migrant workers. Migrant workers can't access universal credit or the support from the from uh, from the from the council for, for the rate support or the rate support uh, rent support or the rate support. And a lot of people don't realise that. They just assume that you know they get everything, which they don't, because those are the myths that's been built up. Um, and these are working people that have made sure that the nation's been fed, regardless of where they were born. You know, they, they, they came over here and they've done a duty to, to keep the country um, in food and quite rightly was awarded uh, by a conservative, actually, a conservative council uh, for the work that they did, not just in protecting their colleagues in the workplace, but those the people in the community too, because obviously the outbreak at their factory could have spread into that community in Northampton had a massive impact as well, um, you know, and, and, and I think it was right to recognise them for, for the work they did, it's right to recognise all of those people that's worked through the pandemic, you know, and put themselves at risk for, for well, certainly for people like me who spent most of their time uh, working from home. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, I mean, in some senses, there's a there's an opportunity at the present moment because I think people have a better appreciation, broadly speaking, of, of how important some of these jobs are that people have tended to look down. You know, the person working in the food factory, for example, you know, that wouldn't have been considered a key worker before that because people wouldn't have understood how vital it is to, to make sure you've got food on the table, etc. Really. Um, but I think at the same time, the, the government and the media have shown a complete willingness to turn on a sixpence and go from applauding you one evening to uh, trying to knife you in the back the very next one as soon as they think they can get away with it. So, you know, from, from my point of view, at least, I mean, I think the unions need to up their game in the same way that some of the media are trying to do it, uh, you know, to, to help get the message out. Uh, but also people need to wise up and think, you know, I'm not in a union, but get in and join one. Now, whatever whatever one's relevant to what you do, find one. There are there are you know rising unions now as well for gig workers, people in insecure work, etc. So you know find which one works for you and get in it because you're much safer in one than not in one. And what Ian was saying, I think, is, is just nice and some some of the benefits up there in terms of you know individual workers on their own would never have got those concessions and got those kind of movements. Um, but when we work together, then uh, you know we can we can actually exercise the power that we've got by being the many and not the few. I think it's really shown some of the jobs that do matter in society, doesn't it? That actually you cannot, you know, if you don't feed yourself, you cannot survive. If you haven't got people driving lorries, you cannot get the food to your shops. And if you haven't got people working in shops, you can't get to the shops and get the food mm -hmm. on the table. So that all those things, people who actually in some of the lowest paid jobs in our society, absolutely vital. Uh, and it, that should be recognised. It should be used to build collective strength. Uh, and actually the people sitting in boardrooms, flicking buttons and moving billions of dollars around the world every day possibly don't really make that much of a difference in the, in the world. And yet they are incredibly yeah. powerful. So perhaps uh, it gives us an insight into what sort of uh, how, how things could be if things were run a bit more rationally than they are, uh, than they are today. And I'd like to add to that as well, because obviously right at the beginning of the pandemic, I mean, um, you know, the, the things that the Weatherspoons workers did um, in making, making Tim, Tim Martin reverse his decision where he was suggesting they should all go and get jobs at Tesco yeah. uh, where he wasn't going to pay them. Um, but because of, the, the, you know, their, their, their actions and because of their collectivism, uh, because they showed strength, every single Weatherspoon worker benefited from, from their courage. You know, because those those workers in Weatherspoons would not have received those payments for, for at least six weeks. You know, so they would have been without money for six weeks. I mean, I know it was difficult for them because they were only getting eighty percent of the pay, but they'd have had nothing for six weeks um, if it wasn't for those for the courage that those those people showed. And you know, obviously, and I thank you know a lot of the Labour MPs that supported that campaign as well. You know, I can't I can't not acknowledge the work that they did. Um, and, and, it, and it truly was a demonstration of how, you know, the Labour movement can work, you know, because that was a Labour movement that came together, you know, from the CUC and all the different trade unions and the, the Labour MPs working together with, with workers who would have suffered um, if it hadn't been for the strength of our movement. Yes, and, I, you know, I mean, it, well, you mentioned the furlough scheme, and I think that's a very good case in point as well, because... You know, Rishi Sunak was happy to take the credit for that and the media had been happy to give it to him. 
But his original plan was to just give more money to companies and hope it would, you know, so, well, I don't know if he did even hope that that would somehow benefit the workers, but he was going to give more money to the corporations. Um, and it was only through pressure from the unions and some of the uh, Labour MPs that they managed to actually force uh, Sunak into doing something different, doing the furlough scheme, which would, you know, much more directly put money in the pockets of the people who really need it. And, uh, you know, the unions haven't had anywhere near as much credit as they should get for, for twisting his arm off his back and making him give that concession. Uh, and imagine how you know, much worse the lives of millions of people in this country would have been if, if they hadn't done that. Guys, we'll wind up shortly, but uh, let me just give each of you a couple of minutes to raise any particular issues that you want to or just have a thought for the day, whatever you think that you want to say in terms of uh, rounding up. Ian, you look ready. So you, do you want to go first? Yeah, I, 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 want, I want to send a message to, to our to our in, in the United States from 5 to 15. I mean, Sorry, but we lost. Start, start that again. We lost you a little bit. I said I want to send a message of solidarity to the sisters and brothers over in the United States. I mean, obviously, everybody's excited that Trump was beaten and thinks that everything is just going to change overnight. But tomorrow, um, the, the workers from 5 to 15 right across America are going on strike to make sure that their demand for 15 is met, that Joe Biden delivers on his promise because they're not prepared to just wait for the politicians to act. And I think that's a message and a, and a lesson that we all have to learn. We can't put and wait for politicians uh, to, to show leadership. We have to be prepared to stand up, fight, and take the fight to them. So solidarity yeah. to the fight for 15. Super. Matt? Yeah, I think uh, one thing that the past year has shown is, uh, as I say, the the absolutely central role that workers play in the world without working the working class looked down on despised treated as uh, voting fodder by some people uh, and actually but without workers there is no economy without workers we can't survive uh, but we need to be organized as workers and for me that doesn't mean general secretaries or presidents even, it means workers on the ground, in the workplace, organising them and their workmates to stand up for themselves, talk together, think together, act together. Uh, that's what we need to come out of this pandemic because the people that we face, with people we're facing are very serious people and they've got an agenda and their agenda is to look after their own uh, and that will mean that we pay the price. And uh, the only way we're going to resist that is by getting organised uh, more than we ever have been to resist them and fight back. I think that's that's the, that's what we're facing in this uh, coming year. Fantastic, fellas. I really appreciate you being on the show. Uh, Keir Starmer, if you're watching, I have a suspicion you, you just might be, then, uh, you know, working people matter and Peter Mandelson is not the way to reach them. Folks, thanks for watching. Thanks for joining us. And uh, we'll see you next week on Squawk Talk and on Socialist Telly. Take care and God bless. You stay safe as all.